I think we'll go ahead and start. Uh, so welcome to the second day of Vector 2018. I'm George, George Landon. I'm the director of the EKU Gaming Institute here. Um, we are really happy to continue doing this with our, um, our fellow sponsors, uh, Run Jump Dev out of Lexington and the Kentucky Innovation Network, a statewide uh, organization that helps spur entrepreneurship and business. Uh, we're really fortunate as well to have additional sponsors, uh, Wendell Wilson Consulting, a local company here, and I Need Diverse Games. I uh, have sponsored a few fo folks here through a scholarship program that they've continued with, and uh, we really like that. It's been a, a really great um, opportunity. Uh, one thing I ta talked with Chris just a little bit last night, uh, he gets to see a lot of games, right? A lot of games, a lot of applications. And um, once you see enough games, you start may maybe be able to recognize where some ga games are coming from. And uh, wouldn't it be just amazing in five years for him to see games and say, hey, that one's coming from Kentucky. That one's coming from Ohio. That one's coming from Indiana. You know, if you start to see enough and they're unique enough games that, you know, that, I don't know, I just think that would be amazing, right? To be able to highlight those. Um, okay, so without further ado, uh, we are really fortunate this morning to have Chris Charla. He's a senior director for ID at Xbox at Microsoft. Uh, they do everything independent developer related, right? That's their anything with Xbox. Uh, prior to joining uh, Microsoft, uh, Chris worked as an independent developer doing everything from design and production to helping create, pitch, and produce original IPs. Uh, and he was also uh, editor at IGN.com and one of my personal fa fa favorites, Next Generation Magazine. Um, yeah, and uh, so we are, I'll leave the stage now to you. So Chris, thank you so much for being here. Awesome, Hey everybody. Um, I just wanna, does anybody recognize what game that is? Okay. I was just curious. Cool, so um, thanks a lot for coming. I've got uh, a bunch of slides, but I want to make sure there's time for Q and A. So I'll probably talk really fast. So apologies if I talk too fast. Um, but just want to go through some stuff about the ID at Xbox program, and then um, probably actually spend most of the time on the um, fourth bullet, just on development tips and kind of maximizing um, uh, maximizing your sales. It's really tailored to maximizing your sales on Xbox, but I think. Probably broadly, most of the tips are applicable to you know other digital platforms as well, whether it's Steam or Switch or whatever. So ID at Xbox is uh, the program that um, I'm the director of. And basically what we do is help developers get their games onto Xbox One. Um, it's, uh, we've been going since but mid-2013 is when we announced the program. First game shipped in early 2014, um, and it's going really well. Um, we announced at GDC that independent developers on Xbox had generated more than a billion dollars in revenue at, uh, at, at, in the Xbox store, which feels awesome. Seems like a lot of money to me. Um, uh, we've got about 800 games in the market. It's more than 1,000 on the way. And um, last year, players spent 4 billion hours on Xbox playing games from independent developers on ID at Xbox. Um, that's like 150,000 years, which is like also seems like a pretty cool stat. Um, so in terms of our goals for the program, they're really simple. Uh, we just want to make it easy for you guys to ship your games onto Xbox One and onto Windows 10 with Xbox Live. Uh, that's basically the first thing we wrote down when we started the program. It's our North Star every day for what we try and do. Um, and, you know, that that's it. Like our our goal at the beginning of the program was, hey, we need to make sure we have diverse content. We make sure when we need to make sure that when players turn on their Xbox One, they have access to like a huge array of games. There's, oops, there's no way that's going to happen without independent developers in the system. And the best way to get independent developers in the system is just to make life easy, and everything else will take care of itself. Um, one thing that was really an article, almost an article of faith for us at the beginning, we knew how 360 had done, was to make sure that we provide a robust and sustainable marketplace for games. Like one of the most important things, obviously, is that you guys as developers can sell your games so that you can keep doing what you love, keep making your art. And um, we knew you know, that the marketplace on 360 was awesome. We felt sure the marketplace on Xbox One was going to be great. I just mentioned, um, I think we're doing pretty well so far. Um, that uh, billion uh, dollar revenue number feels pretty cool. But what actually feels cooler is uh, this graph right here. We first showed this at GDC. So what this is, is um, this is the revenue from uh, our top 20 games in um, 
the first half of our fiscal 17, which would be like, I don't even know why, but June through December of 2016, and the first half of our fiscal 18, which is June through December in um, uh, 2017. So just this last um, six months, it ended in uh, December. And th the green bars are 18, and the gray bars um, are 17. And you can see that you know, it's not all the same games. Like the game in first place is different. Um, the game in sixth or seventh or eighth, you know, whatever place could be different. But it's just how the games in those places did on the marketplace. And it's just ridiculous how much better games in the top 20 did um, in this last fiscal year than in the previous fiscal year. And to us, it just shows that there's really sustained growth in our marketplace. And, um, and that, it, it continues on down the list past 20, but um, this is just like the most, you know, the easiest way to show it. Um, it just shows that the marketplace on Xbox is like really robust, really stable and growing. In, and so to me, as somebody who works with developers a lot, that is like the greatest news I could give you. Like, um, so anyway, sorry, that's just a little aside, but something we think is really great, makes us feel really good about the health of the market. Um, so in terms of how we do things on Xbox, ultimately, we, we started this program by going out and talking to tons and tons of developers about what they wanted in an independent publishing program, and we keep just listening to developers to try and make the program as, as, as good as possible. We're constantly making changes based on um, feedback people give us. Um, work really hard to make sure that we're transparent and just communicating as much as we can um, at all times. Uh, we want you guys to have all the information you need to succeed, and we recognize that as a platform holder and as the guys like, running the store, a lot of times we have a lot of information other people uh, just don't see, especially if your head's down working. And so I, I, the example I always like to give on this is uh, in terms of transparency is um, what's the best day to ship? Okay, what's the best day of the week to ship? So on Xbox, we'll tell you Friday is by far the best day of the week to ship because you're in new releases on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and Monday. Um, weekends is when lots of people are online buying games. Um, it's absolutely the best time to ship. We also like tell everybody Friday is the best day to ship. So Wednesday might actually be a good day to ship because everybody's shipping on Friday and you have Wednesday clear for you know Wednesday and Thursday. Um, you know, but we'll tell everybody, you know, once we know information, we'll just tell it to you. It's up to you guys to do uh, what you want with it, but we'll let you know. I will say Tuesday on Xbox, by far the worst day to ship if you're an independent digital game, because it's the day all the retail games ship. So, um, you know, you'll have, you know, super edition, special edition, premium edition, regular edition. There'll be tons and tons of uh, items assorted in the digital store, so it's hard to get into new releases. Um, you can just get pushed off new releases really easily. Um, so um, another key thing uh, for us is that on Xbox, ID and Xbox developers have the exact same level of access as any publisher. Basically, if a big AAA publisher can do it, like anyone in ID can do it, whether that's programs, whether that's platform features, um, it, everything. There's, there's um, the real difference between an ID and Xbox developer and say a AAA retail developer uh, on, in our back end is just some details in the contract you sign and that the ID contracts don't talk a lot about retail publishing because it's a digital program. Um, and that, that's really it. Um, we make sure all developers who are in ID, once you get a game approved, we send you two dev kits at no cost. I think these days we're sending out one Xbox One S dev kit and one Xbox One X dev kit. Um, no fees. Uh, this is one that I think there's like some confusion about this out in the community a little bit, but just, you never had to pay a fee to Microsoft for certification, for updates, or anything. The only time you might have to give us money, we take a cut, obviously, of the games that we sell, um, but um, the only time you might have to give us money is uh, to get a, um, a Dev Center account. But um, you can also email us and say, I want a Dev Center account without paying, and we'll send you a token for it. But if you've already paid, we can't do anything. But that's really the only time you know, you'll ever have to pay us anything. There's no limit on updates. Like, obviously, recognize games as a service is a thing, and update as often as you want. Um, one thing that actually is kind of a big deal is we have one worldwide submission process. So you don't have to submit a separate version of your game for European release, for North American release, for Asian release, for Japanese release. You submit once, you check which countries you want to release in, and that's it. And that actually is a, a huge time saver. Um, I'll talk a little bit more about this. We do provide development support and, and some promotional amplification. So if you're running into trouble in development, we have um, developer account managers who can come in and help on an issue um, all the way up to there's a 
not secret, but I'm going to say the word secret because it seems secret. There's a secret team at Microsoft called the Advanced Technology Group um, that is like a lot of the guys who write the core software for the platform who will come in and help on um, especially um, challenging problems. Um, on Xbox One, all games are sold in the same marketplace. A game is a game. Um, so that's, that's kind of the program in a nutshell. So how does it work if you want to get involved? So first you register uh, over um, at xbox.com slash ID. I'll, I'll put that address on the screen a little bit later. Um, sign an NDA, um, submit a game information form to tell us you know, what the game is that you want to make, um, whether it's going to be for Windows 10 or Xbox or both. Uh, once it's approved, um, you can get access to everything, the SDKs, all the dev software you need, two free dev kits. Um, and then when you go into development, um, we'll help you with things. We don't do the ratings for you, but we give you a lot of advice on how to secure ratings and everything like that, um, get you through the certification process. Um, I was talking to some folks yesterday about like, hey, I have a concept, I'm, you know, I'm not sure, should I submit it early, should I submit it late? I would encourage you to submit it earlier. Um, there's no uh, downside. If you submit a concept and we look at it and we're like, ah, it seems a little early or you probably need to see a demo for this, you can just submit that later. Like it is not, um, um, there's no uh, like fail state there. Um, so don't, don't stress if you submit something and we say like, oh, let us see a little bit more later. That doesn't mean it's never happening. It just means let us see a little bit more later. So um, I like this chart because it's complicated, uh, but it, <laughs> Uh, it basically just shows the different ways that you can be successful um, on, um, on Microsoft platforms all up. So all the way to the left, to have traditional PC development, make a game, ship it on a PC, ship it on a floppy, put it on your website, whatever you want to do, Steam, good old games. Uh, and then all the way on the right, you've got Xbox development, um, where you need to work with ID at Xbox. You get access to the full um, you know, suite of Xbox Live. You ship on Xbox One. Uh, in the main store. And in the middle, we kind of have some of the different paths for UWP development. So if you don't want to use, um, UWP is our um, dev framework for Windows 10 uh, store. If you don't want to use Xbox Live, you just go sign up um, uh, for a Dev Center account, make your game, and ship it on Windows 10 uh, on any of those platforms. Um, if you want to use full Xbox Live, work with ID at Xbox, um, you can then ship that UWP either on Windows 10 or into the main store on Xbox One. And in the middle, we have the Xbox Live Creators program. So this is a program that lets you use all the social features of Xbox Live, sign-in, presence, identity, leaderboards, clubs, uh, basically everything except for um, a gamer score and achievements and multiplayer. Um, and you don't need to sign any NDAs or anything to do that. You just have to implement Xbox Live, which is um, freely available download. And then um, you can ship your game onto Windows 10. And you can also ship the game onto Xbox One. Now, because um, um, our consumers have some expectations about what an Xbox One game has in terms of features like live, um, knowing that the games have gone through concept approval and kind of hit a minimum bar for quality, on Xbox One, creators program games are not assorted with every other game like they are on Windows 10. They're in a special section called the uh, Creators Collection, um, just so that parents understand like what, what they're um, seeing. And I think... Um, so here's some more details on the creators program. Um, again, it's a totally open program. Anybody can do it. You work with retail Xbox hardware. Um, you can do it with the free versions of Unity and the community version of uh, Visual Studio that you can download for free. Uh, and it's actually pretty cool. Um, but, uh, but yeah, it will, it'll show up um, in the, um, and here's just a quick thing on the differences, um, but it'll show up in the Creators Collection. If you do ship a game in Creators Collection and later decide you want to ship it into the main store, add achievements, add gamer score, add Xbox Live, it's totally no problem. You can use the, that Creators version to, you know, go through concept approval. And I think we've had at least like one or two games that have moved from... Um, Creators program to ID. And we've had at least one game that wanted to move from ID to Creators program, but um, you can't actually do that. Um, so, in terms of some of the um, features and stuff that you guys can take advantage of if you are developing on Xbox, um, there's four things I just want to talk about really quick. Number one is Mixer. I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but this is a, a, a streaming platform that Microsoft owns. Um, it's probably, it's really cool, this is just some stats on the overall streaming market, but some really cool features about Mixer is it's got really low latency streaming. Um, so, um, so that means that you can implement um, features in your game to take advantage of that so that a streamer, so I'll, I'll give you classic examples. 
you make a game, you implement a Mixer SDK, you can implement some features so that um, a person who's streaming the game can enable their viewers to interact with the game in real time and do things like you know vote on supply drops or turn on big head mode or grief you by reversing the controls, um, you know whatever whatever you want to implement. Um, it's and that is a totally platform agnostic SDK. So you could be doing that on PlayStation, you could be doing that on PC, wherever you want. Um, this. The technology is really cool, but you can, you can tell because it's in blue, not green. This is a Microsoft technology, not an Xbox technology. So obviously we support it really robustly on Xbox, but it's, um, it is totally cross-platform. The other thing that's really awesome about Mixer, and if you guys haven't seen this, I, I encourage you to check it out, is co-streaming. So what you can do is if you're streaming, you can team up with up to three other people to do co-streams. So you imagine you're um, you know, a squad in uh, PlayerUnknown's Battlegrounds or something. All four of you can be streaming, and if I go to any of your streams, I see all four streams at once, and the chats are all commingled. So I, there's somebody I follow on um, a mixer, and I, you know, I was, you know, ch you know, if I'm bored, I'll check out, see what she's doing, and you know, if she's playing PUBG, like usually she plays in a squad, and I'll just get to see the whole squad. And and actually, it's cool. Like I got to the point where I. Um, Started to like one of the people that you know she was squad mates with. I followed that guy, and uh, you know, so I found a new streamer that I like. So I think co-streaming is a really, really fun uh, option. And again, as I mentioned, it's um, totally platform agnostic. However, on Xbox, we do have a mixer channel, and um, you have great. If you have an official stream and you're streaming your game uh, on your official stream uh, on Mixer, there's uh, great opportunities to get featured uh, on the Xbox dashboard uh, with your stream. And I can tell you that definitely drives um, interest in your game, drives clicks on your um, uh, game details page, and and you know arguably probably drives sales as well. So um, there's a lot of opportunities to. Um, uh, get promotion via Mixer and via the Mixer team. So if you guys are, um, regardless of Xbox, I really encourage you to check out um, Mixer as a, uh, as a good streaming alternative. Um, so next one is Xbox Game Pass. I don't know how familiar you guys are with this, but this is our, um, it's a subscription service that we offer on Xbox One right now, 10 bucks a month, and you get access to more than 100 games that you can play uh, at, at no additional charge. Uh, games go into the program every month, a couple retire from the program every month, um, and uh, the games are all traditional downloads. It's not a streaming service, it's a download service. Um, you also get a discount on the games that are in there. Uh, First of all, I think it's really, really good value. Um, you can go try it for free uh, now if you want to, but as a developer, it is a good opportunity for a game that's either out for a while that you want to get into Game Pass so that more people get to see it and you know continue to monetize the game after it's been out for a year. We're also looking at opportunities to bring games into Game Pass a little bit earlier um, for games that um, um, you know want to get some good concurrency at launch and you know want to get seen by lots and lots of people. Um, we just did with Sea of Thieves our first day and date launch where the day Sea of Thieves went on sale, it also went into Game Pass. Um, it's been hugely successful. Uh, I think for players, it's been an awesome way to check out the game. Um, it has been really successful for the developer as well. I um, mean, the developer is rare and it's been great for them. It got them huge, huge awareness of the game. And it seems like the game is, if you look at the sales charts, the game is selling super well. Um, and the mix, uh, sorry, the Game Pass numbers aren't in those sales charts. So I, I don't think there's been a ton of cannibalization. Um, so it's been really interesting. But so I think that um, day and date thing is a really interesting option for, it's not for every game, but I think for certain games, so it's super interesting. Another thing that we have on Xbox is Xbox Game Preview, which is our early access program. So this is a way that fans can buy and play games that are in progress, in development, and really participate in the development process, helping the developers um, you know, work on the game, offer like really meaningful feedback. Um, this program has been super, super successful on Xbox One. Um, uh, we've worked really hard to make sure that, A, the games that launch into it, we, we really tightly curate what games go into game preview to make sure that they're um, pretty solid games uh, right when they uh, launch into game preview, even though they're definitely not finished. We've also worked really hard with the developers to make sure that they have good pathways so that they can get feedback from players and, and then that they actually implement the feedback from players. And it's been, um, it's been great. Like Those are just some of the games that are in game preview. Um, it's been very successful for those games, and I think those games have definitely changed in meaningful ways because of the feedback they've gotten from players. So that's been um, super rad. Um, 
So next is uh, Xbox One X. Um, obviously, we have an Xbox family now where we have Xbox One slash Xbox One S, and then we have Xbox One X, which is uh, much more powerful graphically, offers true 4K, offers HDR. Um, for you guys as a developer, uh, for you guys as developers, um, it's easy to um, upgrade your uh, game to support um, Xbox One X, whether it's 4K um, HD or whether it's HDR. Um, I was talking to somebody last night about the fact that, I was kind of bemoaning the fact that, you know, in the olden days, like the PS2 or the PS1 or even the PS3 and Xbox 360, you know, console development was tricky. You know, you needed to have these, like, huge geniuses on your staff to, like, really take advantage of the console. And with, with PS4 and Xbox One and with Xbox One X especially, like, we've made we made this boring. Like the console transitions are like not as not as romantically exciting anymore. Uh, however, I think that romance is always great to look at in the rearview mirror. And like day to day as a developer, probably boring is much better than extremely difficult. Um, and um, when we first um, started talking about Xbox One X and saw how developers were doing, you know, we were seeing people get their games upgraded in like a matter of like days. And then I think. E3 must have been 2016. Um, the Path of Exile guys were talking to the press, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we got the game in 4K in an hour." Um, and like, okay. And and so we started to see when we would send out dev kits, we don't always ask to see builds of the game in development. Like, if you if you want to share one, we're, we're happy to look, but but we don't need to see it till it's ready to come into cert. We started to send out Xbox One X dev kits, and we just started getting calls all the time from people saying like, "We want to show you the X version. We want to show you the or the Scorpio version at the time." Um, because devs were so excited that they were like getting the game like upgraded and like Xbox One X enhanced in like a day. And so um, uh, it's been really cool. Um, if you join the program now, we'll send you a, an Xbox One X kit. Um, if you already have uh, Xbox One kits, we, we can loan you one of these. Um, and uh, the dev kit itself, which that's a picture of, is a super, super powerful, uh, really fast transfer cable, um, so you can download builds or deploy builds really, really quickly. Um, hard buttons on the front. It's actually got a little four-way joystick there, too, um, and a tiny little OLED screen so you can uh, see a fake uh, frame rate mock-up um, or um, anything else you want to do. You can actually put the frame buffer of the game in there just to see what's going on. Um, and uh, I, I have seen a developer write snake and deploy it to that screen. So um, it's like you got to make snake, right? Like, um, so in terms of marketing and promotional amplification, um, you know, when you self-publish a game on Xbox One, you are the publisher. You're, you're responsible for marketing. But we do work really hard to make sure that we amplify your promotion as much as possible. So that can be everything from dashboard placement, which means you know, being featured in our store, to um, going through like, our community and PR and social channels, um, as well as like, themed offers and sales. Like right now, um, I think if you went on Xbox uh, right now, there's a, an indie horror sale. So a lot of cool uh, ID and games from independent developers that are horror themed or on sale. Um, it's doing super, super well. And of course, we, we also do um, uh, show off games at different events and industry shows. Um, so um, this is an example. If you go on Xbox most days, there'll be like actually an ID collection um, in the store. Um, so you'll see like sort of a curated collection of, of different games. Um, these are some of our promotional channels. We've got an ID at Xbox Twitter. We have a blog. Um, we work really closely with um, uh, Xbox Wire, which is just news.xbox.com, which is the official Xbox um, blog. It gets really good organic traffic, but also like every press person in the world goes there every day. Not every press person in the world, but most of the ones who cover video games go there every day to see what, what's up with the official Xbox news stories. And it's easy to get um, you know, a launch trailer on there, or you know, if you've got something cool to say, get a blog up there to talk about your game. Um, so those are some, some promotional opportunities we have. We also have all the normal um, promotional things that happen for everybody, getting mentioned by Major Nelson, being in new releases, which is actually one of the number one drivers of um, clicks on our dashboard. Um, this is just an example of some of the um, ID promos we've done. Uh, Game Fest is something, it's really the spiritual successor of Summer Arcade. We do it every May and um, really work to highlight new experiences, new developers. Um, 
I think this year we're going to have a lot of, um, it's the 10th anniversary of Summer of Arcade, which was this original promotion on Xbox 360 that kind of launched a lot of, a lot of big games like Braid and Castle Crashers, and in a lot of ways, I think, kind of burst uh, independent games into the, the mainstream consciousness of the world. And so this year, we're going to do like some nice uh, anniversary stuff during Game Fest. Um, we also do a lot with events. Um, we, um, starting at GDC, we'll show off, we have a little uh, loft space in San Francisco, and we'll invite a bunch of developers in there to show off games to the press. Um, we show off games publicly at GDC as well, and then, um, E3, PAX, Gamescom in Europe. Um, I think last year we showed off games on like um, at events on like six continents. So we didn't hit Antarctica, but we got like literally every place else. Um, and um, one of the things, you know, obviously, you know, if something like E3, we may have. Um, I think last year we showed off games on like 24 kiosks on the show floor. We there's a lot more than 24 developers in the program. We have more than. I think about 2,500 developers who have um, who have dev kits. So we can't include every single game. We can't include every single uh, developer in every event. Um, but one of the kind of like hallmarks of the program is that we make sure that um, every single developer has an opportunity to be included at E3. So if E3 is coming up and you're in the program, you're going to get an email from us that says um, you would have gotten it like a couple months ago, saying like, "Hey, E3 is coming up." Um, if you're interested in participating, let us know the game, send us a video, send us a build, and then we will get in a room and spend like three, four days just watching videos, like eight hours a day, um, trying to, you know, find things that are cool, find things that people haven't heard about. And, um, you know, again, we can't include um, everybody, but we make sure that everybody has an equal opportunity to pitch to be included. Um, and then at E3, we actually will usually do something that... Um, that anyone can can participate in. A couple of years ago, we made these little Xbox uh, memory sticks and um, had like ton. I think we had like five or six hundred ID uh, developers sending information about their games and links to their site that we put on those memory sticks. Um, and we'll we'll do something similar this year. Um, so it's a pretty good opportunity. Um, so in terms of maximizing success on Xbox, I'll probably talk a little bit slower now and a little bit longer. Um, um, so I, I just kind of want to focus on uh, things to consider during development. And one thing I want to make really clear is that um, I'm going to talk a lot, and the rest of the talk is all about uh, commercial success. Um, but I want to make it clear that you know, we totally understand there are lots of different kinds of success when you're making a game. There's, you know, creative success, making a game that you're happy with. There's just the personal success of, hey, like I shipped something, like I finished something I started. Um, and then, you know, obviously there's commercial success and, and probably a lot of other ways to look at success as well. Um, we're going to focus on commercial success. And when you're talking to Microsoft, we usually focus on commercial success because that's where our interests align, right? You know, we only make money as a platform holder when you guys sell your games. It's really nice. Our interests are perfectly aligned there. So we're going to give you a lot of advice around how you can maximize your commercial success. I want you to understand that, that you should feel free to ignore that advice. Like, do whatever you want. Like, I make text adventures in my spare time. I have no illusions about the success of a text adventure, uh, you know, commercially. Um, uh, and we'll talk a lot about commercial success. If you want to ignore what we're saying, if you want to ship a text adventure on Xbox One, like, that's awesome. You are going to get the same level of support, the same level of excitement from us. Um, um, you know, what we want to do, and this is really in the spirit of transparency, is tell you everything we know about how you can be commercially successful and then let you do whatever you want. Um, uh, and that is really kind of what the first bullet point is, which is to think about how well your game needs to do. Um, you know, you might be making a game in your spare time, or you've got a day job, something like that, and what does the game need to do? The game just needs to be a game. Like, you don't need to worry about success. On the other hand, you might be paying your mortgage with a game, and then the game needs to do a little bit better. And that's when you need to start to think about, hey, how are market conditions? How are things going? Um, I think it's important, regardless of what your goals are, to think about what, what the game needs to do and how you're going to define success for the game um, kind of before you start. And if you do need to hit a certain level of commercial success, which you know I think a lot of people do, um, then you need to start to ask, how well can the game do? Like, How big is actually my, my opportunity space here um, for this game, and then start to think, to ask yourself questions about, you know, is my team set up to promote my game successfully? Because a lot of your sales are going to come down to how well you promote the game. I'm going to go with the base assumption that you're 
game is going to be awesome. Uh, and so then the real question is just how do you make sure the world knows that it's awesome? Um, and you know, other questions I think are really important to ask. Do you have a promotional plan? And if you don't have one, or if the idea of making one like scares you, like um, it's okay to say that you need help. I think the you know independent development is fantastic. Um, the days when to really be considered indie, you had to do everything yourself from programming to art to design to marketing to promotion to sales. I, I think are gone, and and probably. Um, for you know that's that's just fine. So if you are not interested in promoting your game, um, there's a lot of people who are out there to help you. Whether it's um, micro publishers um, or whether it's just people who are really interested in marketing and promotion. I'm sure there's some at this university who are you know working on that career-wise who'd be excited to see a cool product that they could help promote. So. Um, it's just something to think about. And then the last one is just what are the factors could, that could affect my launch? Um, having a good launch is, is one of the most important things that you can think about when developing a console game. Like trying to make that week one, month one um, sales um, you know, as, as robust as possible is, is super important. So that is why the next slide is the most important slide in the talk. Um, so, uh, in terms of maximizing your launch on Xbox One, these seven bullet points are like by far the most important things you can do. Um, and they probably all apply um, just about on every other platform, um, uh, maybe with the exception of the first one, but I, I would make sure that you check that too. So first one, uh, make sure you check your metadata. So on Xbox One, uh, when you're shipping your game, you're going to have to provide us a lot of metadata. Um, that's things like um, search terms that will your game will come up from. Put in things like misspellings of your game name. Put in the genre and the metadata in the metadata for under the search terms. Excuse me. Um, don't put other games names. Like don't put Call of Duty in your metadata. It's it's not a bad idea, but we're onto it, and we will we will take it out. Um, uh, but really check it really carefully because um, search is probably a top way people find your game after um, um, new releases. Um, and um, if you mess that up, it can be pretty bad. And the biggest mistake you can make there is to mess up your launch date. So when you're in development uh, on Xbox One, one of the things you're going to have to plug into the metadata probably pretty early is your launch date. It's pretty early. It's going to be way in advance of when you're launching your game. You're just going to make up a day like... 1910, 2066, it's going to be some weird day. As you get closer to launch, you need to change that to the real date. We're not going to check it. And if your game launches and it has the wrong date, you won't show up in new releases, which just like is brutal. And being in new releases for as long as possible is really, really helpful. We're not like jerks. Like if you call us and are like, oh, the game's not in new releases. We'll check it, we'll fix it, and we'll republish it like as fast as possible. But it'll take, take many, many hours before it'll propagate through the system. Uh, and that's all time you're losing sales. So um, when you're shipping an Xbox One game, there's like no guardrails on that. And um, um, so please make sure you check your metadata. Um, next one is to focus on your asset store like it's the most important, uh, sorry, your store assets, like it's the most important thing you've ever done. Um, when you think about the screenshots, when you're at the point when you need to upload screenshots to the, um, to the, um, the back end for Xbox One and, and presumably for PlayStation and Switch and Steam as well, it is going to be at a time during development when you are exhausted, you are tired, you just want the game to ship, you do not want to have to focus on these platform holders asking for all this stuff, and there's going to be a temptation to like start the dev kit, hit the space bar six times as fast as you can, upload those screenshots and go on to the next task that your sort of sleep-addled brain is trying to process. Um, that's a huge mistake. Uh, th that is a mistake that can cost you like 25% of your sales on Xbox One. Um, like, please, like, never upload a screen of your start menu. Like, no one has ever seen the word start on a screenshot and thought, I need that game. Uh, similarly, like no one, everyone's going to assume your game has options. Nobody needs to see a screenshot of the fact that you can change the volume of the background music in your game. It's not going to sell a game, right? You need those screenshots um, that you upload with your game to be the most evocative screenshots of your game as possible. You should 
try and devote a day or more to this or have a friend who really likes the game play and take the screens for you. You need, you know, whatever kind of game it is, whether it's an action game, you need explosions, you need stuff flying through the air. If it's a, a narrative fiction game, you need a really cool, you know, evocative shot of the background or some key dialogue, something. You know, I can't tell you what the screen should be. I can just tell you make those screens as evocative um, as possible and as exciting as possible. Um, we change how many screens you can upload from time to time. I can't remember off the top of my head what it is right now. I think it's eight. Whatever it is, upload the maximum. And if you can upload videos, upload the maximum. There is definitely um, a, uh, a relationship between games that upload the maximum number of screenshots and your, the number of the conversion rate from opening the game's details page to buying the game. So. Um, or it's, at least there's an inverse correlation. So if you only upload one screenshot, no one's going to buy the game. Uh, so try and upload as many as possible. Um, uh, so this is, I, I mentioned screenshots. Obviously, it's true. The same thing is true for video assets as well. Um, uh, and then next, um, box art. Your, your game cover screen, your box art, is incredibly important. Um, and I really encourage you to design the box art for the marketplace that you're in. So, um, you know, every platform holder has different marketplaces. The Steam Marketplace or Itch or, or Good Old Games, you're going to be seeing the marketplace like this far away from you, right? Because you're on a PC uh, or even closer if you're on a laptop. Design for that. On Xbox, most people are going to play Xbox in a living room scenario. They're going to be, you know, 10 feet away at least from the screen. Uh, don't put lots of tiny little detailed text or images on the, on the box art because you know, you're not going to be able to see it. Like, I encourage you to do everything you can to simulate um, uh, an accurate store experience, whether it's taking a screenshot of our store, bringing it onto your PC, putting your game in there, saving it as a JPEG, uploading it to OneDrive, looking at that screen on OneDrive on your Xbox to see what it actually looks like in the living room, or just printing it out small and taping it to the screen, like whatever. Like, look at the, your box art in the target environment and think about what makes a great piece of box art. Um, think about something that's evocative, something that is you know, easy to read and profile and from a distance. Um, it's, not, it's not in this version of the slide, but I encourage you guys to check out the box art for ARC uh, on Xbox One. Uh, it's really amazing. Um, it's a silhouette of somebody holding a machine gun sitting on the back of a Tyrannosaurus Rex with uh, this sort of sci-fi tower in the distance. And that, like one screen, and you know, half a second that you spend looking at that, you immediately understand that the game is bonkers. Uh, and um, but you know, you're going to be riding dinosaurs, you're going to be shooting stuff. It's got some weird sci-fi thing. When you actually click through to the uh, game details page and see that the full piece of art for Ark, um, there's another person on a dinosaur also holding a machine gun, so that you know that it's a multiplayer game, and it is. It's really, really good. I'm I, so I, I really encourage you guys to check it out. Um, and sorry, I don't have a screen of it today. Um, uh, it's a great piece of box art. I'm not. I'm not saying you should put a dinosaur on your cover, although I don't know, might, might not hurt. But um, but uh, but really try and make something that reads from a good distance. And look at the store. Um, look at the good box art. Look at the bad box art and see what you shouldn't do. But really focus on that as much as possible. Next, um, don't make sleazy box art. Don't think that making something uh, titillating or whatever is going to sell games. Um, First of all, it doesn't. It doesn't. It might get people to click on the box art to go to the game's detail page, but they don't buy it. And second of all, if you do something sleazy, we're not going to promote it. Um, so don't just don't do it. Um, um, go through cert as early as possible. Um, on Xbox One, you can't really officially announce your launch date till you're through cert. Sometimes people violate that rule, but that's the rule. And um, you want to be through cert as early as possible so that you can have time to publicize your release date. I'll talk about that in a second. Um, as well as possibly move the game's launch date around if you need to, um, to, to avoid like some big game that's coming or something like that. Um, if you're having trouble getting through cert, it's no problem. We're going to work with you to get through cert. Um, we're not, we're not going to stress out about it. You probably will, so sorry. Um, um, but uh, just the earlier you get through cert, the more options you have. Um, so please do optionals and everything else. Um, when you get to about six months before launch, 
um, you should reach out to us to talk about launch timing. And there's a, an alias that you'll get when you join the program to, to talk about that kind of thing. Um, there's some conventional wisdom about launch timing. Um, day a week, I, I talked about a little bit already, but time of year, um, we used to say, uh, you know, don't launch, you know, launch from January to July is the best, or January to August. Uh, September, there's a lot of games come out. A lot of people buy games then, but tons of games come out from people trying to beat the holiday season, so that, that pie is sliced into a lot of slices. Um, but some of it is a little bit fluid. Um, one thing that we always used to tell people was like, oh God, no matter what you do, don't launch in December. For talking about digital games, not, not retail games. Um, then ARC launched in December, and like, I'll be totally honest, like, against our advice, we were like, guys, like, don't do this, like, wait till January, and they were like, eh. and uh, they launched in December, it was a huge, giant hit, um, and then since then, um, I think Astroneer launched in December, super, super successful, this past year, PUBG launched in December, I think that was going to be successful whenever it launched, but it was successful, but, but we're seeing some changes there, and we're seeing some, I will now say that December is really crowded with lots of people who know December is a good time to launch a digital title, um, but reach out to us, and we're happy to tell you everything we know, um, but it does seem like um, now we're thinking, after looking at the data from this holiday, we're thinking Mid-December actually isn't a bad time to launch. You don't want to launch too close to um, the holidays um, because people just have a lot of other, other things going on in their life then, and so they're, um, they're not on their digital store. Um, but if you think about mid-mid, you know, sort of December, folks are finishing up with school or finishing up with work. If there's something waiting for them, you know, under the tree or wrapped up, like they can't play it yet, and they're bored, they want to do something, they go online, they buy a digital game. Um, similarly, after January, people are still playing games that they might have gotten for the holidays. Um, so you kind of have to wait till that, that goes. And then uh, hopefully they've still got some holiday money burning a hole in their pocket. Uh, and they start to spend again in, I wouldn't say early January, it's say mid-January towards February is really good. Um, we just did some research. I'm going to show you some of the results of the research, not this part though. Um, and we kept seeing like February is like a really peak sales month. And it's an interesting, interesting time to launch. So there's a lot going on there. It changes from year to year. It's definitely not the same as it was five years ago or even three years ago. So definitely when you're about six months out, give us a call. Um, avoid the shadow of big games if you can. Sometimes this is hard. If you tell us a launch date, we will be really upfront and tell you whether it's a good day or a bad day. Or, you know, to the best of our knowledge, like if you say, hey, I'm thinking about coming, you know, August 18th, we may say like, August 18th, there's a huge map pack dropping. You know, we won't tell you the game unless it's publicly announced. Um, you know, similarly, we wouldn't tell somebody when your game was, you know, what your game was, it was coming out. But we'll tell you, like, hey, this day is bad. You may want to try and get, like, a week before. Or we'll say, like, you know, you'll say, hey, you know, my, you know, snake eating game is coming out, you know, whatever, May 3rd. And we'll say, like, ooh, there's a big snake eating game coming out, you know, May 5th. Do you want to go later? Do you want to go earlier? So we'll, we will, we can't tell you exactly what's coming, but we will give you the best advice we can. And like, definitely please listen to it. Like, um, we may not know much, but we definitely know what we're doing on this. So if we give you uh, advice about release date, understand like we are trying to help you make as much money as possible. Cause again, that's how we make money. Um, it's not on here, but I'll definitely advise you, do not try and counter-program against a big launch. I remember there was a game that um, was, you know, wanted to come out, I think, on the same day as, like, a Destiny or a Halo or something. And we were like, man, don't, don't do that. And they were like, well, we think, you know, people who don't like that, you know, the big shooters will want to play our game. And, like, that is, like, a thing that you can think, and it seems like it makes sense. But the problem is the... Dash is nothing but that big game that day. And then also, I'll say just thoughtfully, and I don't want to be mean, like, just because somebody likes your game that is not like a big shooter does not mean they don't also like big shooters, right? I mean, just look at the Twitter accounts of people, some of the you know, incredibly influential indie devs who make really interesting indie games. Look at their Twitter feed the day like Destiny comes out. And like, people like shooters. And you know, even if that's not necessarily the kind of game they make. Anyway, in this case, the game came out, Unfortunately, he got slaughtered, and um, I saw the dev at a, you know, some event later, and he was like, oh, you know, I bet you're excited to say I told you so. I'm like, no, like, I don't want to say it. Like, I, I feel awful. Like, that's terrible. Um, uh, there's no 
getting to say I told you so is lame, A, and B, like what I would have liked to just come out on a different day. So anyway, I don't try and counter program events against big games, at least on Xbox. I don't know if it works um, other places, but it definitely doesn't work on Xbox. And then um, last one is release date awareness. This is just um, crucial. One of the things we see on Xbox is that if you have a game that is you know, anticipated, that people like, Getting the release date out there as early as you can is really important because something seems like it happens when you say the release date. Um, if somebody had heard about your game, maybe played your game at a show, seen some you know mixer videos of your game, or seen it on Twitch, whatever, the second they know there's a release date, they start to make the purchase decision in their head. You know, the money kind of mentally goes out of their wallet. And you, what, what we see is that games that announce the release date um, well in advance. Um, tend to see some real benefit. So I would say to you guys, when you have a release date, when you're through CERT, start talking about that release date, tweet it till you're blue in the face, retweet yourself, make your friends tweet it, make your mom tweet it, like do everything you can to get that release date out. Drop a new trailer that has the release date all over it. It is um, really important. I would also say that if you're through CERT early enough, you can also do a pre-order on Xbox One. Now, digital pre-orders, there's not a huge reason to do a digital pre-order versus buying it the day it comes out. Um, but what it does do is it gets your game onto the dashboard. And you'll you'll start out far in advance. And as the day gets closer and closer, you move left. Sorry. You move left towards, like, release. And your game is just on the dashboard in the store, like, earlier and earlier and for a long time. So I think that's, like, the real benefit of a pre-order. It also gets that release date out there. So release date awareness, I think, is, is super, super important. Um, so how can you anticipate how your game's going to do? This is a slide where I used to spend a lot of time talking about how you could parse Steam Spy data. We don't have Steam Spy to kick around anymore. It's a mega bummer. Um, um, I spent a lot of time optimizing how you could derive stuff from Steam Spy. It's all gone. It's a bummer. Um, I think we're going to see a bunch of things. You know, maybe there'll be a replacement. Um, I, I do think there's a chance that Steam Spy may um, perk back up as more generalized but less less precise. Um, I think we'll see the return of review counting, where you're really just looking at the number of reviews that a game gets to kind of determine relative performance versus another game. Games with more reviews tend to have more people buy them. People don't usually uh, review games they haven't bought, and on most platforms they can't. Um, I will incur just remind you, Twitter is probably not the best way to derive sales success. I know that for my Twitter feed, I follow a lot of people who make the kind of games I like. So when a game is the kind of game that I like comes out, my entire Twitter feed is full of it. Therefore, it must have sold really well. Well, not necessarily. It just means that the people who I follow really like it, but I follow them because we like the same kind of games. So um, don't, don't use Twitter as a way to derive uh, sales success. Review counting is probably better. Uh, but as I think as you're thinking about making a game and you, you are trying to derive, like trying to put together some kind of comps, um, I might look at um, sort of the, the remains of Steam Spy, although I went there a couple days ago because he said he was going to leave everything up. And actually, some of the sales pages were blank. Um, but it, to the extent that it's still there, I, I would sort of check it out. But I would look at um, just the number of games in your chosen genre. So if you're trying to make say, a platformer, how many platformers are out there? How many platformers shipped last month? And that, even though it doesn't tell you precise sales, it can start to give you an idea of like how tricky it's going to be to, um, to stand out in that genre. Um, next, I would always look beyond genre itself to art style, platform, tone, storyline um, when trying to consider your comps. And then, um, especially on Xbox One, considering your tail potential when evaluating the ultimate performance of your game, I think is really important. Your game's going to have a launch month, and then it's going to have a tail. And so let's talk about tails, and I'll try and talk quick because I want to get some questions in here. Um, try and understand what your tail may look like. Um, I would strongly encourage you to consider DLC if it makes sense for your game and you're trying to maximize sales success. Um, on Xbox One, um, a tail is a real thing. Um, developers keep selling games for years and years and years and years. Um, your tail is going to be a function of your launch. I'm going to show you a couple of pieces of data really quick that actually um, um, might suggest that there's some changes going on there. Um, and with one key exception, you're really going to get one launch on console, so you really want to try and uh, optimize for your that first launch. The, the exception is if you're in Game Pass, when you go 1.0, you get like another nice little bump. Um, but, um, so this is um, a typical 
uh, sales curve for a game. This game was on sale for about four years um, when we took this uh, picture. I, I can't show the, gra the uh, scales, unfortunately. But this is a, a story-based game. There was no DLC. You can see it had a really good launch month. And then it kind of went down into its tail. And those little spikes are from different sales it was in. But today it's kind of in its like long, long tail. That is a typical um, no DLC, play at once, story-based game on Xbox. This is what a typical free-to-play game looks like. This is not derived from one game. This is uh, an amalgamation of a couple games. Um, but but it, it's very accurate. Um, scales from graph to graph aren't the same. This one starts about twice as high as the last one started. Um, but you can see that free to play has got you know a, a totally different shape tail. Um, you know driven a lot by seasonality and, and new releases and new content. I'm not telling you guys to make a free to play game. I'm just trying to show you kind of what the tails look like. Um, so this is something kind of interesting here. Um, so this is back to that that story based uh, game. That's that same tail. Um, so this next game I'm going to overlay on it looks a little different. So this tail is also for a game that's pretty similar. It's a they're both um, single player games that cost 20 bucks. They got four stars in user ratings, and they both made the exact same amount of money to within like just a couple thousand dollars. Like they basically did exactly the same. Here's a difference: the tail, the launch month on the the one, uh, the second one I overlaid, the the one that's black. Um, it only did about 50% of the sales, like 52% of the sales of the first game, but it ends up having like a way thicker tail. Um, that is really counter to our convention. You can, it, you can see it had a sale there about probably three months in, sort of like the other one did. That's really counter to the conventional wisdom of how games perform, which is that the function of t uh, launch to tail is like a regular function that's the same for every game. Um, we found this when we were starting to do some um, research on around GDC and we we're looking at um, back compat sales, not for our um, sort of like top 20 games, but the sort of next tier down um, of, you know, games that I think have been really successful, made, you know, hundreds of thousands to millions of dollars, but are not like the, like the bonkers success stories. And what the more we looked, the more we started to see. So the only key difference between this um, these two games, again, single player, four star, $20 um, games with no DLC, um, like is that one released a, like a year later than the other, right? So the black graph is about three years data and the green graph is about four years data. So what happened to make the launch kind of like a bummer, but the game performed, the, not really a bummer, but like half as good as the other one, but the game performed the same in three years as the, the first game performed in four years meaning that after four years, it's gonna have made like more money. Um, we don't know, uh, but I'm gonna show you something else now too. <laughs> um, like we're trying to be as transparent and clear as possible. I have, I have some, we're working on some theories, but we need a lot more data. And this is data that we have, but we just haven't looked at it this way. So I wanna look at the impact of maybe having DLC on your tail. So this is a different game, um, again, but you know, sort of same similar tale. This is an action game, um, had a couple sales. Um, but uh, it, it was also a $20 four star game. Um, we really tried to normalize that in looking at this data. This next one is a game that had DLC. Again, both these games have made like roughly the same amount of money. I think it was about $10,000 difference on this one. Um, the one with DLC had like, you know, what looks like a terrible launch month compared to the first game, but it's had this really, you know, I mean, the, the, the tail is like really fat compared to launch. Uh, and it's only been out two years, and it's made as much as this other game made in, in four years. And so um, that the green one is also a four-year game. So like, okay, so same amount of money in half the time, that, that game's gonna perform really well over the full four years, yeah. So like, why does the black graph stop? That's the end of its sales. That was its sales through February. Um, so the, I'm, the, I've just basically, this is like month one to when it stopped. Yeah, so it, it, it just stops there because there's no more data. But um, yeah, so because it's, it's only two years of sales where the green one is four years of sales. So again, the weird thing is this game had like half the launch month, but a really fat tail, I think aided by the DLC. Um, does that mean that we're seeing something change with um, tails? Like are we seeing that ratio or that function of you know launch to tail change. I don't know. We're we're working on it um, back at the office and trying to figure that out. I think um, to the extent we are, it 
feels really healthy. Um, you know, I'd much rather have like this sort of sustainable fat tail. Um, you know, I'd trade that for like one big launch month uh, in a heartbeat. Um, so it's, it's really kind of interesting. And, and so this is just like, again, this is data from, we really pulled it like last month for GDC and, um, and it's encouraged us to like dive in and do a lot more research. Then we got back from GDC and we were busy and we got into E3. So I haven't done the research yet, but hopefully next year I'll be able to show you guys more and, and, um, give you more data. Um, question people have sometimes is, can you change your tail? Um, I would argue, yes, this is a game that hasn't been on sale for a super long time and you can see like it. Again, the function between tail and launch is like really different here. Uh, they made a huge update, um, added a big feature to the game, and they saw their sales spike like higher than their launch month. Um, and we've seen that a couple times. Historically, I'd say that would never happen. And we've now seen a couple times people have been able to beat their launch months. Um, so anyway, it does seem that you can change your tail. Um, I'm almost done, but I want to take a couple questions. Um, blah, blah, blah. Platform's doing really well, so you should develop for it. Um, and uh, apply today. That's the um, address, and uh, happy to take some questions. Are we good? Okay, thanks, everybody. If anybody has any more questions, I'll be hanging around afterwards. So thanks a lot.